Tim, now that we've concluded with the calendars, I need the glass making department, as well as the plastic department, to make some new items before the month ends. Landon said as he handed over a notebook to Tim. Landon wanted to make clinical thermometers and lenses that had different sizes as well as thickness. For the lenses, he needed both departments to make plastic and glass lenses. Next month, microscopes, magnifying glasses, telescopes, military binoculars, and long-range telescopic rifles would be produced. So he needed these lenses ASAP. Of course, in the future, eyeglasses would also be made from these lenses. The viewing areas for binoculars, telescopes, and rifles all worked with the concepts of refraction and sometimes prisms. Take binoculars, for example. Light would pass through a lens that sends the light to several prisms and other lenses, and finally directs the light to the human eye. And depending on what type of item was to be produced, the lenses could be shaped as biconvex, biconcave, planoconvex, and so on. Also, depending on the shape, size, and thickness of the lenses, people could view objects that were several miles and yards away, like snipers who could shoot their targets at the top of buildings from far distances. For now, Landon refused to make grenades and other heavy artilleries without a separate industry for militia. Some of these weapons needed to be installed at high pressures, with the help of computer programs and machines. They needed precise computerized measurements to make them effectively. Gunpowder was a little bit dangerous to make, but not as dangerous as the rest. Hence it was doable. As for the other weapons, they would have to wait for now. A slight error, and several people could die. Hence Landon only made things that required bullets and not pressured or complicated weapons. Back on Earth when grenades were made without machines and computers, hundreds of people died daily from making them. These weapons were used for World War I and II, at the expense of other people's lives. Ladon didn't want the blood of citizens on his hands. These were medieval times. If someone lost their loved ones in the industry, those people would for sure blame Landon. They would probably hold him responsible and march to his castle. Although the people were kind and honest, the human heart was a fickle thing when it experienced tremendous pain. If someone's only family died there, that person would fall into despair and might even lose his, her sanity and moral ethics. There were people who had turned into murderous villains because of their grief. The only methods of death that these people accepted were from disease, war, hunting, and traveling. Any other method would give them a huge blow. Plus, he didn't want them to fear working at the industry sites or even pulling out their children from the schools. Landon would never do anything if he wasn't sure that the workers would come out unharmed. So for now, he would focus on making guns and other items that wouldn't necessarily cause a massive explosion during the production phase. And if explosions occurred, they were generally small-scale and didn't harm anyone. At the industries, several failures had already taken place during experimentation, but it was usually the machines that broke down or the products that got destroyed. There wasn't any explosion that destroyed an entire room or building. And Landon wanted to keep it that way. After Landon explained how each lens shape was to be made, he moved on to talk about thermometers. This was another item that Landon was pleased to make. Within this era, although people didn't know specific temperatures, they had their own ways of figuring it out. They used several materials to estimate the temperature of their furnaces. Sometimes, they used stones, wood, and even grass. They used fire for alchemy, sword making, construction, molding clay, and so on. So, of course, they had their own way of estimating the temperature. For example, when they were making swords, they would place several palm-sized rocks at the outer perimeter of the fire so as to estimate the temperatures. At different temperatures, rocks would produce different amounts of soot on them, as well as disintegrate. And at molten temperatures, rocks generally turned into ashes. Of course, these people never got to those levels, as swords generally needed way lower temperatures compared to rocks. So at each temperature interval, the one of the stones would be removed and the sit thickness would be checked. And the rock would also inspect it to see how many pieces had been broken down by the fire. And of course, those who had been blacksmiths for years didn't need to use these methods anymore, as they could estimate the right temperatures just by feeling. People in this era used their intuition and experience to maneuver around life daily. They made alchemy potions, swords, medicine, clay ornaments, powders, and so on. They did things based on estimation. The bad thing was that number two products were ever the same, but they did have an 87 to 95% quality similarity between them. Back when Landon was building the new industries, he had requested for industrial thermometers to be made. So the industries weren't his concern right now. His major concern was for the hospital and clinics. 
He had totally forgotten about clinical thermometers and had been completely focused on the industrial thermometers. So since all the industries now had industrial thermometers, Landon felt that the glass industry could slow down the production rate of those ones and make the clinical ones instead. Hence he gave Tim the design notes on them, since they were somewhat different from industrial thermometers. Tim looked at its design patterns and realized that it still used the concept of mercury in a tube concept, except it was very small and had a short temperature range compared with the industrial one. Also, Tim, I need you to take out some of those thin long thermometers and send to the school. The chemistry students need them as well for their experiments. No problem, your highness. I'll send them right away. Thank you. Oh, that reminds me, how far are you guys gone with the preparations? Your majesty, I've selected 200 people from all departments within the construction industry and we are now ready to go. Good. Should the men start picking up the uniforms for the event? Tim asked. Of course. Tomorrow is the last registration date for the citizens, so have the men pick up their uniforms after that. This event needs to be as professional as possible. Yes, Your Majesty. The capital, Empire of Arcadena. Your Majesty. We have been able to produce the snow powder successfully, the royal alchemist said. Alec Barnes' eyes lit up. What did you say? Ha 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 with this, Arcadena would be the strongest empire within the Pino continent. Ha ha ha, Alec said excitedly. The royal alchemist and his team smiled as they looked at the look who had was usually cold and scary. Now he was laughing and clapping like a teenager. King Barn turned to his knights and began issuing out several commands. Quickly, start sharpening sticks and get a large order of ropes and arrows, as well as tubes for the snow powder. From now on, you all need to walk around with sticks and ropes. I'd like to see who would dare attempt to oppose me with this snow power bahaha. Now I'm the strongest ruler within the Pino continent. Everyone quickly went and sharpened several sticks, while Alex smiled on his throne. Oh, Shannon. If you're truly planning to take my head, then I'll show you no mercy. He, -he. Outskirts of Profus City, Arcadena. Martyr Shannon and three of King Barnes Knight Captains were making their way down to Riverdale with several thousands of men under them. Right now it was getting dark, and they were close to the city gates of Profus. It's getting late. We will stop here to make camp, one of the captains commanded. Before Martyr could say anything, another captain issued another command again. We'll camp in different areas for tonight. Martyr. You take you men and camp on that area over there. While we will camp by the other areas. You're dismissed. For Martyr, Perfuss was the city where Baron Kane, his father's sworn enemy, resided in. So he wasn't really happy about making camp close to the city. If something really happened to his father, then King Barn or Baron Kane would be his first suspects. Sleeping by the enemy's territory was something that he had never dreamed of doing. But since he wasn't in charge of the journey, he had no say on the matter. Perfus City was a large and prosperous one. And although there was a city lord within Perfus, he was a weak one who gave Baron Kane all the power within the city. Baron Kane was a typical tyrant who walked around terrorizing and beating people here and there. In Martyr's opinion, the current city lord who was just 23 years old was definitely being threatened by Baron Kane. The young city lord had been appointed after the death of his father, probably due to Baron Kane, so he didn't have much authority or a voice within the city. Hence and Perfus, Baron Kane was the law. Martyr and his own men began to build their tents, as well as hunt for their dinner as the moon started to set. Young master, how can we continue to stay here? One of his men grumbled while chewing on the roasted leg of a hare in his hand. This is that bastard's land, another complained. Just who do those night captains think they are? They are fully aware of Baron Kane's enmity for your family, young master. Martyr gripped his spoon tightly as the men began to rain a series of complaints about their situation. Indeed, he was pissed off by the way that those captains shoved him up and down. But he knew that he had to be patient. Once they got to Riverdale, these captains would stay with him for another two months. And once it was over, they would be on their way back to the capital. All he needed to do was keep a calm and docile appearance while they were with him. But what he hated the most were lowlifes who thought they were nobility because they had somehow made their way as knight captains of King Barn. And to make matters worse, they had disregarded all his suggestions and opinions on the journey. They had been constantly rude to him and treated him like he was trash, just because they had King Barn's support. From their attitudes, Martyr knew that they shared the same enmity as Alec Barn had for his father. Knights generally reflected and acted out by the way that their ruler or commander behaved. In Martyr's mind, no matter how late his revenge came, he would definitely act it out. He kept all their actions deep within his heart. 
After dinner, some of the men went to their tents, while others guarded the campsite. The night quickly became dark, cold, and shrouded with mystery and danger. Some men were fast asleep, while others guarded the cold campsite. Fup fup. For assassins made their way to the campsite. Their target was Martyr Shannon. Within the royal palace, Baron Kane had a total of ten spies was working there as palace guards. With a ruler like Alec Barn, people didn't know if they were safe or not, so they had to send their spies there. At least if their king was planning to do something like beheading them, they could easily make their escape from Arcadina before they got caught. Hence most nobles had at least five or more spies within the palace. As soon as the spies heard the news of Martyr going back to Riverdale, they immediately sent a messenger to quickly deliver the news. Martyr only left a week after the news was released, so the messenger had at least a week-long head start ahead of him. For urgent messages like this one, several towns, merchant trading companies, and cities had their own messengers under their rule. Some of these messengers were even protected by a royal degree. So no one ever messed with messengers. The roads were difficult, dangerous, costly, and time-consuming. Hence important people like rulers and nobles had little time to travel. So they came up with the messenger system to get news across faster. Once Baron Kane's spy sent the urgent message through a dispatched messenger rider, the guy rode to the next town or city and gave it to the next messenger, who in turn did the same until the message had finally arrived Baron Kane's hands. So unlike Martyr and the three captains who rested each night, the messengers only rested if the distance to the next town was fairly long. And sometimes, a rider would travel for two days straight just so that he could dump the message to the next person and be done with it. Hence Kane's letter came way ahead of time before Martyr's arrival. Once Kane read the news, he immediately hired four assassins around Profus City and gave them a painted portrait and details about Martyr Shannon. These assassins were medium-ranked death assassins who would definitely kill themselves if they were ever caught. There were several routes to go to Riverdale, but Shannon knew that they would definitely pass through his territory. The spies within the palace had also said that King Barn might send a letter for him through the three captains, hence he was sure that they would use this route. Fup. Fup. The light sounds made by the assassins came from the top of the trees. To those below, it sounded like the wind gently patting the branches of the trees. Once the men arrived at the flashiest tent at the center of the camp, they instantly knew that this tent was Martyr's own. All four masked men in black clothing dropped down from the trees and closed in on the tent. From outside, they could hear the steady breathing sound coming from within the tent. Their target was fast asleep. Two decided to surround the tent while the other two made their way into the tent. As soon as those two entered the tent, they immediately spotted a human figure sleeping on a pile of hay. They immediately closed in and stood on both sides of their sleeping prey. They immediately took out their knives and helped them upwards in attempts to stab their target. But to their surprise, their target instantly pulled out a sword from under his pillow and instantly blocked their attacks. Now, Martyr yelled, Hua! Ten knights immediately yelled while bursting out from the hay-covered floor as if they were zombies coming from the dead. Cling. Cling. The assassins began to fend off the numerous attackers coming from all angles. The two assassins fought with grim and bloodthirsty looks in their eyes. They seemed like rabbits that was cornered by several hungry wolves. Ah. One of the assassins screamed out when he was painfully stabbed at the back of his neck. There were just too many men in the room, and just like that, he died while struggling for air. Martyr's sword had trusted from the back of his neck and protruded to the front. The assassin had held his neck pitifully and had struggled to get even a whiff of air into his body. He then began shaking like a fish out of water and immediately dropped to the floor. After a while, his face became deadly pale and looked bluish in color. He was finally dead. The other assassin in the room didn't have time to be concerned about his friend, as all ten knights were now focused on him. Martyr stepped out of his tent, as he was clear that that assassin inside would definitely die. Martyr saw another assassin fighting twelve men within the camp, and another dead assassin on the floor. Once the last remaining assassin saw Martyr, he immediately knew that the mission had failed, and he would probably be killed. His present condition was bad. His left hand and legs had been injured terribly during the battle. The only reason he had tried to stay alive was to see if the mission was successful. If they had succeeded, then he would die happily with the thought of their target following him to the world of their ancestors. But when he saw Martyr, he had completely lost any hope of a happy death. Hence he bit his tongue and swallowed the poison in his mouth. Martyr sat on the ground and waited for the charade to end. In his mind, he was clear that this was the work of Baron Kane, and maybe King Barn as well. 
Once the news of his departure went through the palace, he knew that Baron Kane would definitely not let this opportunity go. Every important noble had spies within the palace. Even his father's side had them too. So how could he not know that Baron Kane would get the news about his departure? If Kane succeeded in killing him, then his father wouldn't have anyone to take after him. A man without a successor was equivalent to a man without a pin asterisk asterisk. A male child was one of the reasons why people could continue to rule for several years to come. It was required that within the first 15 years of commanding an army, if the appointed ruler didn't have an heir to take over his place once he dies, then the position would be given to another person. And if all the male children died, then that ruler would have to step down within the next two months. If Martyr died, then his father would no longer hold any form of power within Arcadina. His father would have to hand over all his knights, and most of the family's privileges would be revoked. They would still be known as nobles, only by name. But in reality, they would be the laughing stock of the entire empire and would definitely be bullied and looked down by their enemies. Martyr could already tell that his father was dead. He had been feeling like this several months before he was summoned to the palace. He knew his father well. So he knew that his father was probably dead or in grave danger. But before he concluded on the matter, he just wanted to go to Riverdale and make sure that his thoughts and feelings were false. Previously during the daytime, his scouts had said that they had seen the three captains secretly going into Profus City, which immediately raised his suspicions about their purpose. Why did they go into the city? Did they know that Cain was trying to kill him? Were King Barn and Cain working together to completely destroy his family? After killing his father, did they also want to kill him as well? Because of this situation, in Martyr's mind, he was very clear that King Barn and Baron Cain had worked together to kill his father. He swore in his heart that he would avenge his father even if it was the last thing he did. The sad part of it all was that, although Shannon had died, all these people still refused to let him rest in peace. King Barn and Baron Kane thought that Shannon was coming for them, while Martyr suspected the two of killing his father. And so, the misunderstanding continued to grow, and the actual culprit was sleeping soundly in Baymart. Sigh. It was a world filled with misunderstandings. What is this? Monica asked while looking at the toilet in awe. Today was the 22nd of September. It was the third day for the official Baymart house tour. Speaking of the residential homes, since the construction workers had basically built several buildings within the new industries, they could easily accomplish this task given to them. There were 7,000 workers assigned to building the homes. And Landon had made 259 groups, with 27 workers in each group. The workers worked in the same manner as they did at the industries. As they waited for the cement to dry, they would run off to do the foundation, floors, and walls for other residential homes. In this way, each group had successfully built several homes at once. And at the end of the first 11 days of September, over 520 homes had been built. Landon had been preparing for this tour day since the beginning of the month, hence the citizens had been registering for the tour since September 3rd. He had also asked for mortgage contracts to be printed off for every house constructed as well as assign people to become movers within Baymart. For the tour, Landon only wanted 70 homes to be displayed to the citizens. As for the original Baymartians, they had already started moving into the other homes on the 20th of the month. Landon had tried to make every home a little unique and different from the other. Some homes had wider windows, different stair designs, different floor tiles, different structure arrangements, and so on. He had made different designs for each home and given it to the workers. But although they had different designs, each home had a basement floor, ground floor, first story, and a second floor. For all homes, the ground floor had at least a kitchen, high ceiling parlor, a back porch that led to the backyard, dining room, toilet, and garage. Of course, in the future, when bigger homes and mansions were built, more rooms would be added there as well for those who wanted to live lavishly. On the other hand, the second floor had at least three bedrooms, one bathroom, and a master bedroom that had its own bathroom and balcony. And finally, the basement had four rooms that could be used as laundry rooms, guest rooms, or storage rooms. With this, Landon hoped that those who had large families could live peacefully as well. Hence, these were family homes. Although the original Baymardians were 1,500 in number, some of them were married, had children, lived with their parents, and so on. Hence, although the workers had built over 900 homes in District D, e, only about 416 family houses were actually needed for the original Baymardians. That's why Landon had told the workers to store house construction in District D e and move on to the next district. 
Of course, within those 1,500 citizens, there were also those who were siblings that had lost their parents, as well as those who were alone or had few other family members with them. For these group of people, some of them might still want a family house. After all, they would still get married in future. Better to start planning now. But for those who don't want family-sized homes, Landon had built apartment complexes as well. Every after three street blocks would be a street block filled with three-story apartment complexes. Of course, some apartments were bachelor pads, others had two rooms, three rooms, and so on. Each apartment also had a balcony, and there was a massive car park at the back of the buildings. As for the orphaned children, they would continue to stay in the upper region estate where the caretakers could look after them. And once they grew up, they could get work and get their own places as well. In this way, Landon hoped that he would satisfy everyone. Anyway, for the tour, Landon had fully furnished those 70 homes so that the citizens could see what their homes could look like when fully furnished. Of course, if they wanted their own pieces of furniture, then they would just have to buy them as well. And within each tour day, Landon had scheduled three tours in total for each home, from 10 a.m. to 6 p.m., with each tour taking 15 citizens at once. On this way, by the end of the first day, 3,150 people would have seen the homes. Previously, Tim had assigned 200 workers from the construction industry to act as real estate agents and drivers. Some would be tour guides, while others would drive the citizens to the tour destination. Since the citizens didn't know where the homes were, Landon had them meet up at the Central Region Square. From there, the drivers would drive each team up to the homes and take them back. For example, if he had told some of the citizens to come to Liar Street House 34, it was obvious that none of them would know where it was. Hence, it was only proper for them to be driven back and forth. For sure, Landon named all the streets based on the birth names of the citizens. It was just too stressful to come up with new names. There were streets like Liar Street, Tim Street, Wiggins, Merriam Street, and so on. Each driver had a daily registration sheet with them that showed the names of those that they were supposed to drive. In this way, they could do a mini roll call just before heading out. As for the tour guides, there were two groups, those who showed shoes those Fort 70 homes to everyone in Baymart. And those showed and mortgaged the homes out to the original citizens. In Landon's mind, he wanted to the tour to be perfect, so that everyone could see and marvel at the homes that they, as Baymartians had built. Monica, her husband Jerry and her children, alongside some other people, currently stood outside one of those 70 homes. The home was definitely a beauty. The house exterior was a mixture of gray and black. The windows and door frames, including the garage door, were black, while the other parts of the house were gray. And from the front view, they could see that the house had another floor above ground level. Although the house was way smaller than a castle, it could still rival it in terms of looks. And the most surprising thing was that the roof was somewhat flat, artistic, and didn't use sticks, mud, or hay to hold it up. Landon didn't want to use tiles, since he preferred those modern Hollywood-looking mansions that had flat roofs. It was way cooler, and cost less for maintenance compared with roof tiles. No matter how one professionally roofed a house with tiles, after several years, some of them would fall to the ground. Then you'd still have to bother about replacement, maintenance, and so on. In Landon's opinion, it was better to stick to modern flat roof designs. Jerry's lips quivered as he looked at what he would describe as a mini-castle from the heavens. He turned around to see his wife's stunned expression as well. Monica, this could be our home, Jerry said. Monica snapped out of her thoughts and nobbed back at her husband. Were they dreaming? They could actually own such a house? Wasn't this type of placement for royalty? She couldn't help but thank her ancestors for sending their king to Baymart. In fact, she felt like if she saw Alec Barn, she would seriously thank him for his decision as well. Thank you, Alec Barn. The people around her also began talking passionately. Is it real? We won't have to live in those stick homes anymore. Mummy, mummy, is it true? When has His Majesty ever lied to us? They said that we could move in first because we were born in Baymart. Yay. Several of them did a silent prayer to thank their ancestors again. To them, the most hated period is winter. Within that season, their houses would be blown down by the storm and several people usually die drum exposure. But with a house like this, there was no way that the storm would blow down the homes. It was a miracle. Their prayers had finally been answered. They continued to thank their ancestors as they walked on large gray outdoor tiles that led straight to the house. Once they were at the front of the house, a man stepped out through the door and greeted them. Welcome to the Baymart House Tour. My name is Hayden, and I will be your tour guide for today. When the tour group saw their tour guide, they were shocked. What was he wearing? 
And where could they get theirs? Hayden, who was currently standing at the front porch, wore a thick gray form-fitting shirt, thick black form-fitting pants, black socks, and a black jacket. The way he was dressed, his manner of speech, coupled with his neat ponytail, brought out his facial features even more, and made everyone feel like they should respect him. The men in the group all made mental notes to get their own as well, who didn't like to look good. Plus, the material was way thicker than the airy light fabric they had on right now. Before entering the house, they took off their dusty shoes and places them at the front of the porch. All right, if there's anything that piques your interest, or if you have any questions, you can always ask me while we tour. I will always answer them for you all. Now, let's begin, shall we? Hayden said with a charismatic smile on his face. Or at least that's how the women viewed it to look like. They all nodded back and followed him into the house. Before they had come in, Hayden had spread out the curtains across the windows, which made the room dark. When Hayden flipped the switches on the wall, the light instantly came on and the room became bright. What sort of sorcery was this? So it doesn't use fire? Someone asked. No, it doesn't. No fire? So when we want to put it on, we just have to do what you did. Correct, Hayden said with a smile on his face. He too understood the reason for their shock. How can one light up a room without fire? Even in the entire Fno continent, Hayden was sure that only someone like His Majesty could come up with such methods. His Majesty Landon Barn was simply a once-in-a-lifetime genius. As the tour progressed, Monica and the others had been utterly taken in by the house design. The smooth gray porcelain tiles, the black couches, glass tables, brown cupboards, the large glass windows, gray curtains. Oh, that was stunning for Monica to describe. Even the kitchen looked like a place where one could sleep in. Wait, wait, wait. Are you saying that if we roll this thing left, water will flow out? Monica asked while looking at the tap. Correct. This is called a tap. Turning the left side gives out hot water, while turning the right side gives out cold water. Here. Try it. Monica turned on the left side and the water shot up from the tap. Oh. Everyone exclaimed in awe. She then frightenedly placed her hand under the water. In her mind, this was definitely witchcraft. Who knew if something else would flow out from the tap? As His Majesty had always said, better safe than sorry. As she waited, the water kept getting hotter and hotter, and she quickly turned it off. Everyone had seen the steam from the water and knew that what Hayden had said was true. Monica immediately opened the right side and cooled down her hot hands. Everyone clapped as if they were watching a show. Ha 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 ha. It works. It works. So we don't have to fetch water at the wells anymore? This is great. Ha ha ha. I used to go to the streams around the coastal region because of the long waiting lines. Now I don't have to wake up so early anymore. Ha 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 ha. Good job, madam. Good job. Monica began to blush as people clapped. As the tour continued, the excited people clapped whenever they saw something out of the ordinary. Even when the toilet on the ground floor bathroom was flushed, they clapped so hard that their hands had become red and swollen. Once they were done, they climbed up the stairs and headed up to the second floor. One should know that the ground floor parlor had high double height ceilings. Hence the stairway led to the second floor that had an interior balcony which overlooked the parlor. Standing on the balcony, Monica held the black rails and looked at the parlor below. From here, she had a better angle and appreciation for the interior design. Amongst all the things that Jerry had seen, the master bedroom to the cake for him. It had its own private bathroom, as well as its own balcony. Plus it was the biggest bedroom in the house. Papa, Papa, I want this room, said their four-year-old daughter. No, you can't have it, said their six-year-old son. Jerry looked at his son and smiled. What a sensible lad. No wonder you're your father's son, he thought while smiling. You, you can't have it. Because it's my room, right, Papa? His son asked. Jerry's smile froze. What an insensible fellow. You are definitely your mother's son, Jerry thought. He then looked at his wife helplessly, and she in turn giggled and shrugged her shoulders. Of course, the tour concluded with them seeing the basement and the backyard. And of course, the show finished with a tour of the backyard. Once they left, Monica and her husband immediately requested for their own personal home. Since they were born in Baymard, they could start viewing the other homes that weren't within those 70 tour homes and move in ASAP. So after another three days of viewing several other homes, Monica and her husband decided to go with the fifth home that they had seen. They signed their mortgage plan and were also told how much they would have to pay for all their utilities monthly. For now, Landon had set up fixed utility prices, depending on the size of the house. But of course in the future, all of that would definitely have to change. 
Monica and her husband didn't have a problem with the price, as they thought that it was reasonable and fairly cheap. Firstly, they themselves had way too much money than they could spend, and had always wondered why His Highness increased their pay by so much. Ever since Monica started working, she had only used not up to one-seventh of her pay every month, while her husband also used 1.5-7 of his own pay monthly. Every month, they would combine their money and plan on how much they need to spend for the month. Of course, they bought books and pens for their children, but that was only at the beginning of each semester. And to be honest, it was still cheap. They didn't have to pay for their housing, as they still lived in their thatched homes. They didn't have to pay for transport, as they walked everywhere. They only bought kitchen equipment, like pots, only once in a while. In fact, they could say that their money was mostly spent on food. They had been working since May, and to be honest at this point, they had way too much money. The second reason why they agreed to pay for the mortgage and utilities was because they felt that it was only right. Since they knew that the money was used to pay the workers who supplied heating, electricity, and so on, wasn't it right to pay for something that they would use? When they read through the mortgage, they were even pleased with it as it showed that they could make payment installments and so on. There was even a section that asked if they were disabled or suffered from any serious illnesses. This showed that even if something happened to them in the future, there would always be a way out for them. Hence, they immediately signed their contract and took the numerous bundles of keys from the real estate agent. The front door key, back door key, and so on. Plus, they had also been given four spare keys for each door. Sorry, um, where do we get those pieces of furniture? And where can we get these clothes? Jerry asked the real estate agent. Do you know the large estate by the two old date-marking buildings? Yes, we do, Monica replied. Good. You will find all the new products there. Since some of the new products made are too big to be placed in sheds in the central region, that estate is now being used as the new the marketplace. Really? That's good then. So when we buy the products, do we need to carry them back? The real estate agent shook his head. For the heavy ones. After paying, your house address would be noted down and the movers would bring the furniture right to your home whenever you are free. So if you choose Thursday at Z 10 a.m., then they would be right there on time. Jerry and Monica's eyes lit up. Once they sent the real estate agent out of their new home, they immediately hurried over to the new marketplace. It was time for shopping.